everyone. Uh, this is Sonny here in Dallas where I'm at. I'm hoping everything goes right with this. Uh, my laptop's had the blue screen to death about three or four times over the past 24 hours, so we'll keep our fingers crossed for the next 45 minutes to an hour that everything stays good. Um, thank you for the introduction, Normal. Uh, today's topic that um, I put together is data and quality and integrity and calibration, but it's really more focused around a case study moving from a paper-based or hybrid calibration programs to paperless. Uh, a lot of the lessons learned um, and really a lot of focus around the project management of a very complex global project in nature. And make sure I have this working. Brief about PCI, we're a privately held, employee-owned and operator firm. Uh, our main office headquarters is in Raleigh, North Carolina, but we do have a lot of field offices in LA, San Francisco, Boston, Atlanta, Indianapolis. We just recently opened up one in Boulder. Uh, we, we like to call it the three C's. Our core capabilities are around calibration, commissioning, and consulting. I'm actually the senior director of the consulting division. Uh, I retired about a year and a half ago after a long career with an institution and I decided that retirement probably wasn't right for me. <laughs> Good or bad, I'm back in the industry again. So our consulting group, we really do understand the complexities associated with implementation of calibration and maintenance programs. Uh, and we look at ways to enhance and streamline the programs. We do have experience in multiple different software platforms, business processes, and align into ISPE and other type of best practices in the industry. So without ado, I'll get on to the program. Um, and again, this is a case study. It's delivering a global calibration program, a single way of working for a major uh, pharmaceutical company. So, you know, what was the problem? What, what was the problem or problems that needed to be solved? There, there are eight separate locations. They're operating as individual entities under the same management structure. So there is a site in North Carolina. There are two sites in Pennsylvania, one site in New Jersey, and four sites spread across the United Kingdom. For a total platform and footprint of about 8 million square foot of R&D, pilot plant, commercial facilities. Um, there were many procedures, systems, and business processes that were in place. Uh, at the time when we addressed this project, I think there were something like 390 individual procedures across all of those sites. There were multiple quality issues, and it depended on the site. Uh, what the types of issues were, because each each site had different ways of working when it came to calibrations. Even on the same site, um, you had sites where the programs and the business processes were actually tailored for individual customer groups. So it was hard to take individual calibration technicians from one area of the building and put them in another area of the building because they were unfamiliar with the ways of working within that building because it was inconsistent. Six total CMMS solutions across all of the sites. Two of the solutions, there's actually only two, two vendors, but they had six different validated versions and six different ways that they were configured. Uh, and each site uses solutions different including common fields that were used for different purposes. So for instance, they would use location as a field, but it meant different things for each individual site. All the processes were hybrid solutions for calibration. What I mean by that is there were no fully paperless solutions and there were no fully paper-based solutions. They're a combination of paper and CMMS uh, and there were no consistent global metrics to measure the program performance. And that was actually one of the key drivers, was to be able to measure the performance of the calibration programs across all of the sites consistently in a standard way, and then look for areas of opportunity to increase the quality of the program while 
hopefully having an impact on the cost and compliance. So the objective, deliver one common global way of working. One master SOP for calibration, that was the goal we tried to achieve. One common set of KPIs across all of the sites. The paperless solution, we wanted to implement a paperless solution that included electronic signatures. A common global data set. And then the ability to utilize the data that came from calibration to make better informed decisions on procurement, quality, and instrument use. One of the challenges that we had was there was, outside of the manual intensive paper-based evaluation of instrumentation, we had no simple way to be able to influence decisions on capital projects, on the type of instrumentation that we should be putting, uh, looking at reliability, uh, repeatability of the instrumentation. Um, so we wanted to push this paperless electronic process to find all of our metrics up front so we can make better informed decisions down the road. Some of the challenges that we knew up front going into this project, many legacy ways of working. There were over 50,000 instrument calibrations that were done on a year, yearly basis total. We knew that we had over 2 million fields of data that, that was going to be required to be developed for this project. We had an unknown total number of data extracts required from either paper-based processes or multiple inconsistent locations in the CMMS systems. What I mean by that is um, maybe a text field that was utilized within the CMMS system was used to capture test points, but it was inconsistent in the way it was being used, so we couldn't develop a data migration to get the data out. We had to define where things would be manually readied, so to speak, and then where we could potentially extract data through um, data migration protocols. The project, though, was not a data migration effort to a standard platform. Um, it was not an IT process project. It was a combined project of business process improvement with an IT element. So we did not drive it from the IT perspective. We drove it from the engineering perspective. So a little bit of the upfront work that had to be done on the project. We wanted to normalize the total numbers by applying industry best practice first. We knew going into this that we executed a lot of calibrations over the course of a year. We also knew going into this that every site assessed what was critical to them in different ways. So we applied the ISPE baseline guide to calibrations and implemented a risk-based approach. In doing so, originally we had 50,000, roughly 50,000 calibration events that were assigned to 35,000 instruments. So we used a risk-based approach by looking at what was truly critical, and we were able to reduce those to approximately 19,200, or a roughly 45% reduction. The way that was done is some of our, the locations if an instrument was located in a building that had any type of GMP process associated with it, the legacy ways of working were, were everything in that building then was classified as GMP critical. So we took a risk-based approach by looking at the actual equipment within the building. Was it direct impact, indirect impact, or no impact? And then based upon the impact of the equipment, looked at the criticality of the instrumentation associated with it. So that way we knew if we had a no impact piece of equipment, like maybe an office air handler in a GMP facility, we had no quality critical instrumentation on that. And then all instruments that were of non-critical, we decided we were not going to perform a calibration where we had a pass-fail output out of it. We decided instead what we would have is a preventive maintenance program against those type of instruments if the site wanted to. They can manage it their own way. 
once we were able to, via a risk assessment process, reduce the total number of instruments that were done, then we decided to take a look at the way we calibrated instruments. And the way we calibrated instruments based upon legacy practices was more of a per instrument base. We moved into a loop calibration model. When we did that, we were able to reduce from the 13,000 or 19,200 instruments to 13,500 physical instrument loops, which we calibrated. And that came out to about 21,600 events a year. So in all total, we were able to reduce the number of calibration events by 57 or 57% um, that were expected. This was all the upfront project work that we did to try to normalize what we, data we needed to move. Because once all was said and done, we still had about 45,000 rows of data that equaled about 2 million fields of data that required significant human intervention to ensure the accuracy to get from all the source systems that we had. The data came from multiple sources. It came from CMMS systems. It came from calibration master lists that were in the form of Excel PDF files or um, access databases. There were calibration assessment forms. Uh, there were archive calibration certificates that had to be pulled out of archives for paper-based calibration certificates. And the data was dispersed across all those sources. There were many field requirements that existed in consolidated text locations. Uh, we needed to review past hard copy calibration records to capture the new system data requirements. And we just could not map from the source to a target because the data was not in the same format. Um, for instance, in some of the CMMS systems, one of the fields was engineering units. Engineering units was spelled 19 different ways. Degrees C had the symbol degrees with a capital C. Uh, multiple different ways. So we, we could not do a data migration. So after we normalized everything, we had a massive project plan that we put together. We had to move into the IT selection process. What solution were we going to use at that time? We put together one of the first key elements was to put together detailed and concise user requirement specification. We performed the due diligence on our software suppliers. We looked at the validation process that they had as an organization for the software. We looked at aspects such as what was configuration versus customization? What was standard out-of-the-box functionality? What do the e-signature processes look like for handheld devices? What kind of built-in workflows do these solutions have? The ability to, to handle multiple electronic signatures based on instrument criticality, um, or was it just one way of working? Did they have single sign-on capabilities, authentication? Um, one of the reasons for looking at that was this way then, we would know that we could manage usernames and passwords based upon a higher level authentication process versus just at a single platform level. Do they have internal system audit trail capability and more importantly, accessibility? I know with a lot of the new data integrity um, guidelines that are coming out from the MHRA and the FDA, that's actually one of the areas that they're looking at is the accessibility, the review process, uh, and putting in review processes for your audit trails. So did the system have the capability to easily access the audit trails? We wanted to create a standard data loaded template. So as part of that selection, we needed to take a look at their bulk upload capabilities. Um, and was there a standard data loader template where we could collect all this data in one swoop and load it up in? We needed to create common field uses and terminology. You know, that was a big key here was every site, every location, had to use the field in the same way. It had to mean the same thing from site to site. 
Otherwise, your KPIs and your metrics would be skewed. <coughs> and then we had to have standards for the user-defined fields because we did allow that. Um, we, we implemented uh, the solution that had multiple user-defined fields uh, to allow for a slight amount of site variance in the business processes. But it did allow minimal variability for local site modifications. An example of this is one of the sites uh, from an analytical equipment perspective. They wanted to keep their validation documentation or the PQ information and referencing. So we allowed that within the solution. Then from a project plan perspective, we created roles and responsibilities. We defined clear roles and responsibilities for the delivery of the end-to-end -end calibration. That was key. Who does what and where within the process. We configured the solution to align to those roles and responsibilities. So we had a matrix of every individual, what they, their role was, what their responsibilities were in the calibration process, and the security and access rights that they have within the system. And we aligned all the personnel to those roles. We assigned one global system administrator. We did not want multiple people administering the solution. So we had a global system administrator, but then each site had one administrative role. Uh, and other sites could be used as a backup. When it came to the procedures and the business processes, we created detailed flowcharts for every business process associated with calibration. So we had the instrument assessment, new additions, change management, planning and scheduling, execution, including the use of the IT solution, third-party calibration process, standards and reverse traceability, task lists, work order closure, decommissioning and out of service. This was key, was to develop detailed business processes with the flow chart. Uh, it, there was a misconception in the company at the time that deploying an IT solution was everything you needed to do to deliver a paperless calibration solution. The IT solution was the tool. You needed to de develop the wrapper around that tool on how you're going to use it, all your inputs and all your outputs associated with it. We developed a detailed Microsoft project plan for the entire project. That included the IT deployment play phase. The plan was massive. Uh, it exceeded over 1,000 rows. Every task was defined in there with deliverables, the resources, the duration, and we tracked the completion percentage. There was a project RACI. The initial project was supposed to be nine months. It ended up extending to over one year by completion. Uh, because of the complexity of the project. One of the keys to hold the whole thing, though, is implementing a robust communication plan for all the impacted stakeholders. So that was your owners, your quality teams, your engineering, management, and any service providers that were used to deliver calibrations at the sites. So now I'll talk a bit about the data development phase. This was where the challenge was. We had the IT solution defined. We had the project plan defined. We had the future ways of working defined. So now we were in the phase where we can start working on gathering the data. We developed that global standard template. We de developed all the required data fields that we needed. Utilization of each field was fully defined, uh, and we created a guidance document around this. One of the key areas, because we knew every site had different different starting points from a data perspective. So instead of one overall data migration development protocol, we'd had, we ended up divide, developing eight of them. Each site had its own data migration and development protocol. Some sites were 100% manual data gathering. Some sites did everything on Excel sheets and paper-based. Some sites we actually were able to create a slight bit of um, initial data by migrating uh, data from source systems, whether it was a CMMS system, Excel files, or access databases. And then some sites, although the initial data could be migrated, they required a lot of manual intervention to that data 
to look at past hard copy calibration records to ensure that there are no changes in the process. This is just an overall flow chart of the data readiness. I won't go into it in detail. I've got the next few slides are um, data ready or are, are all flow charts. But this one was the higher level on how we were going to ready the data. And then we got into and we flow charted every individual process for every protocol for the extraction process, where it came from, whether it was from current calibration master list, which are hard copy, to the CMMS systems, multiple CMMS systems. Then it went down into the data cleansing component. The key here, and one of the key takeaways, which I talk about at the end, really, is the approval processes of who approved what. We wanted to get the data and we had to get it ready for a data approval process by the instrument owners and quality representatives. Once they approved everything, then we got it to where we could start mapping the data and getting it into the, the loaders. And then we went through a data loading and a verification process too. So it wasn't just the load into production. We had three different um, load processes into development test and um, production databases and we challenge the data at each stage within the process. But one of the areas that we needed to address was the project was a long project. It took us a while to get all the data together. So we wanted to make sure that we did not impact operational business. So we had to create a process for refreshing the data uh, at certain points for instance, the CMMS systems, they would still be performing calibrations at the time. So we need to make sure that any data that was changed from the time that we did the initial extract out of these out of these systems, any data that was changed was captured into our data collection template. And then we had a robust customer and subject matter expert approval process. The project team itself had subject matter experts on data throughout the whole process where they would review the data at certain percentages of the data. After that review, it went to the customers to review. It went to the quality organizations review. And then it would get down to the data cleansing teams. Um, so we put a lot of processes in place to make sure that the data would be reviewed by the appropriate people at the appropriate time. So like I said, there are eight individual data management and develop protocols throughout the whole process. All the data that was captured and cleansed was aligned to a single data collection template and load file. All the primary data sources were identified up front in the beginning of the project. You know, were they coming from a legacy IT solution? Were they paper-based records? Were they Excel master list? Subject matter expert review was included in every step, customer review, and the quality review. The data template review, all the data loads reviewed and, and were checked three times. Like I said just previously, there was a development and a test and a production environment. Some of the lessons learned throughout this project, spend the time up front to fully develop the ways of working in the business processes. Um, when the project was first proposed, it was proposed more of an IT-based project, which was let's hurry up and deliver the solution. In reality, the best approach that we took on this project was to look at the business processes first and the ways of working, and then marry in the IT project. Thoroughly vet the solution providers, because what they say it does versus how things really work are two different things. That was one lesson learned. Define all the data sources up front, electronic or paper. And in order to do that, you might have to get down into the weeds to find out, because we found out uh, it was very enlightening to find uh, spreadsheets, paper-based forms that were being used unbeknownst to outside of the procedures that were used to manage calibration and, and were used to manage data. Develop rigid data readiness and migration protocols. 
to me, it wasn't a traditional IT project. It was not a traditional data migration from point A to point B. Uh, so we really had to define how are we going to get that data ready and what is that review process going to look like to ensure the integrity of that data from the source system to ultimately the new solution that was being delivered. Embed multiple checks and approval steps by subject matter experts and users and quality throughout the whole process. Upload data only after approved by the appropriate personnel. Other lessons learned, be prepared for the issues. Some issues that were identified throughout this process, we found that the last calibration information that was on the hard copies was incorrect. So it was the quality of our source data was also not up to snuff. Um, the data migrated from the source systems was incorrect. Data migrated from source systems had standard fields that were spelled differently. Um, for instance, percent RH versus RH or degrees Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit. So we had multiple ways. Um, unfortunately, the new solution required one way. So that had to be cleaned up. Another area was personnel changes. The customers responsible for reviewing the data had changed. You know, and as an engineering organization, we had very little understanding of who the new individuals that owned those instruments were. So there were personnel changes over the course of the project that we had to keep our eye out on. We had to include time to retrieve hard copy files into the project plan. You know, if we needed to review 300 records on a Friday, we need to make sure we had those records available, especially if they had to come from a cave somewhere in Arizona. There was a massive amount of manual intervention that had to be accounted for and factored into the project. That was a lot of expense, but it had to be accounted for. And again, the project had to be treated as a business improvement project, not just a traditional IT solution implementation. It was a partnership between IT and the business. Some of the issues that we identified, though, after deployment, even with all that effort that we put into this project up front, the quality of the initial source data was questionable. There were issues with the legacy data, so basically bad data in gave bad data out and it was identified after the program went live. There was no full understanding of the new IT solution either. Um, even though we thought we understood it, you always learn stuff. So there are global parameters that could be set on the new IT solution that when it was changed, it affected all instrument data with respect to significant figures. Uh, so this is where we found that the company had corporate policies on rounding and significant figures, but the IT solution used a different rounding methodology than the corporate policy stated. So the rounding methodology was the IEEE or the banker's rounding methodology, but the corporate policy was based on a system, um, a asymmetric arithmetic rounding. Uh, it's the type of rounding that Excel uses. So that was an area of concern after deployment. And then, of course, the culture change. One of the biggest issues that we realized was head nodding yes at some cultures only means that they hear you, not that they agree with you. Post-project Im implementation, afterwards, they were trying to embed the past ways of working into the new business processes to try to maintain a little bit of the legacy. For instance, removing the need to maintain hard copy calibration records or implementing hard copy paper approvals in parallel with electronic system approvals, because that's just the way they were used to. Couple last slides here. One other thing that we identified. If you take a look at the slide here, you've got your paperless calibration server and you've got a workstation, okay? So the individuals log in on the workstation and that login then has got the audit trail for when they logged in and they're on the account. And then they would download the calibrations to a handheld device. So the audit trail would show who and at what time and what calibrations that individual downloaded. Then they would take that 
handheld device out in the field, execute the calibration, come back, and up log into the workstation and upload those calibrations. Those calibrations, again, would have that audit trail of the individual A um, and when they logged everything back in. What happens if it's a two-person calibration? Here was where we ran into some data integrity challenges after uh, deployment, which we didn't really anticipate. And that was if it's a two-person calibration, same thing, individual A logs into the solution, downloads the calibrations that they're expected to execute. So from a system perspective, the audit trail says technician A downloaded and did the calib uh, downloaded the calibrations to execute. But technician B is the one who has the handheld and is writing the data because technician A is up on a ladder somewhere in an obscure location and is yelling down to technician B what the data values are from the calibration. So technician B is actually holding the handheld, entering the data. Once it's done at the end of the day, then technician A goes and uploads that data back in. So from an end-to-end -end calibration perspective, it appears that technician A downloaded the calibrations to execute, technician B uploaded the calibrations and executed, when in real life, that's not the way it worked. Um, technician B actually is the one that captured the raw data. Uh, so this was an area that had to be addressed through um, setting some security on the actual handhelds itself. So th those are some of the issues that were addressed. So with that, that really is a brief overview of a very large project. I see one question as to the reason for the project, and there was a huge financial reason for the project. Um, with multiple ways of working, calibrations and doing that many calibrations was a very, very large cost for the organization. We had to find a way to streamline the calibration process, um, reduce the cost, but at the same time, increase the quality of the program because the old ways of working allowed way too many opportunities for human intervention and mistakes to be made. So by taking the process, moving it towards paperless, applying the risk-based approach, we were actually able to reduce our calibration costs by over 30% within the first calendar year that the project was deployed. So there was a, a financial driver for it. At the same time, there was a quality driver. So with that, what I'll do here is, uh, Norval, I may need your help here to go through the questions. Okay, that I there, are, there are other questions that came up prior to that one. Okay. Uh, the first one that was asked, is did the corporate goals provide any guidance as to what was considered important to capture within the calibration process? Okay, I'm not sure I understand the corporate goals. From the project goals, yes. Um, as, a, as a corporation, um, we put together what we call a calibration blueprint document, which defined key KPIs that we were trying to capture from a calibration perspective at every one of the locations. And it, it was those, the, the output of that document is what we use to capture key parameters within the calibration process. One of them, for instance, is we wanted to capture the length of time that it, wrench turning time that it took a technician to calibrate the instrument. Okay, so we built into that process using the electronic tool a way to automate where we could the length of time it took an individual to perform the calibration. And the reason for that wasn't to take a look at the efficiency of the individuals per se, it was to take a look at the, the length of time it took to calibrate certain technique groups of instrumentation. And we can use that for future benchmarking 
uh, even uh, for hiring decisions and recruitment justification in the future. I hope that answered the question. Okay, the next question is, what was the logic used to allow paper-generated output of a calibration system? Well, if you talk, if that question is referring to the legacy practices, the paper-generated output was more of the um, blank work order. It was used more around the scheduling and the asset management aspect. So they would print out a blank calibration certificate that had minimalistic data, and then that was used to capture, the paper would then was used to capture the raw data. So it was used more, I, I wouldn't call it a calibration system. I would call it more of a CMMS, maintenance management solution. Okay. okay. Uh, the last question I see is, did you maintain a paper collection system? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, everything was used. Uh, if the question is referring to post-project implementation, the paper-based collection process was really focused around what I'll call the new instrument addition and the assessment process or the birth certificate for that instrument. That process up front was paper-based and then it would attach electronically in the system. And then any third-party documents that came in would be scanned in and stored with the paperless solution, the computer-based solution. Those were really the only two paper-based products. If we required a calibration certificate, it was system-generated because the system of record was now our paperless calibration solution. That was the primary record, was the electronic version, not the paper version. Okay. Uh, the next question, uh, what kind of decisions do you make now with this business improvement? Well, I've since retired, um, so it's up to others to make the decisions, but I can tell you some of the background of what decisions were to be made. Operationally, from an operations perspective, we would have information on, you know, calibration comes in peaks and valleys. Now we have more measured true data on the length of time it takes to calibrate certain types of instrumentation where we could better project the amount of resources that we would require during plant shutdowns and certain times throughout the year to manage the peak calibrations. Um, we were also able to look at our ways of calibrating. By looking at, for instance, individual A takes three hours to calibrate a certain type of instrument. Individual B takes an hour and a half to calibrate that same type of instrument. What are the differences? What are the drivers? Um, uh, so to make some decisions on the calibration approach. From a capital perspective, some of the other drivers, we were actually able to use that data to feed into the capital project's perspective on the, on the more reliable instrumentation that we should be purchasing as a company. Because uh, what we found out was that there was one certain make and model of temperature transmitter that was used on product critical uh, applications that actually had a failure rate of and an adjustment rate of over 50%. So 50% of the time we had to adjust that instrumentation to bring it down within the tolerance because it exceeded the 50 or the 80 percentile. Maybe it wasn't out of tolerance, but we still had to adjust it. And it had an extremely high rate of failure. We were able, able to really see that um, without going back through all the paper-based documents. So 
those were the type of decisions. They're both from an operational perspective and from a capital perspective, a pro project improvement or project installation perspective. You're welcome. Okay, now there was one question that was sent, but it looks like it only came to me, but I think it was meant for you. Uh, what KPIs were used to evaluate calibration? Uh, some of the big ones in the beginning, obviously, were um, calibrations done on time, number and percentages of out of tolerance failures. Uh, we did implement a grace period from a calibration perspective. So how many calibrations moved into the grace period, what percentage of them, and how many of them were done by the end of the grace period. Uh, trying to go back to remember because it's been a few years. The big ones were really, though, more focused around the quality delivery, making sure that we executed to deliver on deliver when we said we were going to deliver. Uh, the big difference was every site had different metrics previously, so we were able to standardize on those metrics in the reporting and look at each individual site. At the same time, one of the other business improvements, uh, after this was implemented, the ways of working were consistent. We were actually using individuals from the UK to perform quality review in the US because it was standard ways of working. When we had peak workloads at our Pennsylvania sites, we were able to take people from the North Carolina sites and bring them up to Pennsylvania with zero to no training curve and vice versa. Anything else, Norval? I'm not seeing any other questions. If anybody else has a question, uh, please go ahead and type it now. Uh, in the meantime, uh, one last final reminder that our third and final uh, lunchtime webinar for April will be uh, a week from Thursday. It will be Thursday, April the 27th. And it's being co-sponsored by ASQ Charlotte Section 1110. Uh, it's Lean Transformation and Global Procurement by Denise Hyken, Operational Excellence Lean Change Agent at Ingersoll Rand. So I know many of you have signed up already. Uh, we're going to release uh, the GoToMeeting uh, login information here uh, later today, so you should all have that uh, information uh, ready for next week. Um, it looks like one more question did come in, Don. Uh, was there an increase in employee satisfaction? Very good question. In the beginning, I'll be straight up and honest with you, no. And part of the reason for that in the beginning was because it was a huge change. Every location, everybody had a new way of working. Um, and unfortunately, when you have, when a project like that, you just can't include everybody in making the change, otherwise it would have been better. So there, everyone went through the change curve. In the long run, over a period of time, absolutely the satisfaction went up because the, 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 Everyone wanted to use the new technologies. You know, they wanted to move to a, when you're hiring a new technician today out of college, you know, they're actually learning on IT solutions. And then they come into this industry and they're doing things on paper. You know, so it did increase the satisfaction. There was that change curve that we had to get over first before that the satisfaction really started to embed. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, I think that'll about do it for today. It's uh, about nine minutes before the top of the hour, so uh, if no one has anything else,
I'd like to thank Don uh, for presenting for us today and would also like to thank those of you who uh, came online today for this webinar and we look forward to seeing some of you uh, join us next Thursday for our third webinar of the month. Uh, until then, uh, hope everybody has a good rest of the day. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye now. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.